to just keep dancing to the music that is going there, but it is time for us to begin the weekly broadcast of the Twist Podcast. We're going to talk about science tonight. Welcome, everyone. We are so glad that you are here, that you've joined us, and we are ready to jump into the show. Make sure you hit those loves and likes and all those things, because the more loves and likes we get, the more the algorithm decides that we're something good to share. So give us the love. We do appreciate it. Ready to start, friends? Let's do a show. Let's do a show. Let's make it go. All right. Science team, activate. <laughs> All right. Starting in three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 895, recorded on Wednesday, October 5th, 2022. Who teaches you science? Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on the show, we are going to fill your heads with AI, ATP, and better banana beer. But first. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. As Florida recovers from a destructive hurricane, the conversation about climate change hangs in the air like a wispy cloud of foreboding, barely noticeable in the aftermath of a massive storm, and it is mostly being ignored by media and politicians and even by people directly affected by the damage. But there are questions that need to be answered. Is climate change to blame? If so, to what degree? And can we do anything about it? We know Florida will be hit again. We know it wasn't prepared this time. Lack of water, lack of emergency power, substandard building codes, and a lack of evacuation support. And we know more people will die as a result of future storms. So, should the devastated areas even be rebuilt? If so, should they be built to withstand hurricane winds, flying debris, severe flooding? Is that even possible? Ultimately, it will be up to Floridians to decide in a state that is in political denial of climate change and its implications for increased hurricane precipitation, sea level rise, and storm intensity, they will likely repeat the same man-made disaster we saw this past week. Meanwhile, the greater man-made disaster looms as climate change threatens to make Floridians of us all. But for those of us looking to overcome our inner Floridians, there is hope. Climate can be predicted, mitigation can be achieved, and all we really need to ride out the storm of the future is a good supply of This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough, I wanna learn everything, I wanna fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week, there's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. Kiki and Blair. Oh, Kiki, you're muted. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to talk about all the science that's fit to podcast. That's right. We're going to do that like we do every week. I have stories about this year's Nobel Prize winners, ATP Origins, that banana beer I mentioned a moment ago, and a consciousness hypothesis for y'all. What do you have, Justin? I've got uh, orcas versus sharks. I've got uh, an asteroid creating a mile-high tsunami wave. Yikes. Goodness. Uh, Oh, something we might be able to do to protect the painted ladies of California and uh, an unexpected Nobel Prize. Thank you. Thank you very much. Unexpected. Yeah. We're going to talk about that. Those Nobel Prizes 
in just a couple of seconds. But Blair, what is in the Animal Corner this week? I'm so glad you asked. Um, I am going to talk about how AI is going to take your job if you're a whale scientist. Um, also, <laughs> I'm going to talk about some great ape friends. A great grape friends. I don't know. Oh, There's that's something just great. There. Yeah. There's something just, there. And then great. um and then I'm gonna talk about some red kites. Ooh, I like kite flying. That's yes, nice. this is the animal called a kite. Oh, the yes. bird. bird. The bird kite. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Well, as anyone who is currently viewing or listening can see or hear, there is a fantastic show ahead. So we will jump right into it. But first, I do want to remind you that if you have not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, you can find us all places podcasts are found. All of them, pretty much just look for This Week in Science, Twists. You can find us also broadcasting, live streaming weekly on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch at 8 p.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays. That's right. It is not daylight savings. It's, it's not the time change hasn't happened yet. And the time oh, is always... Oh, is no. that happening still? I thought we got yeah, Like a month from now. Yeah, so it's that. Uh -huh, but anyway, no. yeah, no time changing yet. We're all good here. And if you like to follow us on the social medias, we're on Twitter and Instagram as at Twist Science. You know, and if there's all the complications of remembering this stuff, just remember our website, twists.org. Thank you for your attention. It's now time for the science. Okay, we are going to talk about those Nobel Prizes right about now. Right about now. The science is so amazing. Every year, the Nobel Prize uh, is awarded for a number of subjects. And in the sciences, we get to have chemistry, physics, and physiology and medicine. So for chemistry... Oh, this... it's physiology... Or medicine. Or, or medicine. Or, okay. or it's a very... Which, that, which I think is important. a very... Yeah, I think it's a very uh, silly silly named category. But they, they, they somebody decided, which one should we do? Nobody decided before they went to print. And so uh, it's both. And, no, but it's, or, there's an or, or in the title of the prize. Yeah. Or. <laughs> which, whichever one. It's fine. That one, maybe yeah. two. All right. So chemistry... Um, chemistry was awarded to Carolyn R. Bertozzi, Morton Meldahl, and K. Barry Sharpless for the development of click chemistry and bioorthogonal chemistry. It, 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 you know what that is? No, it's I was hoping you'd tell us. Of <laughs> it's origami. Like, yeah, well, the the click, yeah, uh, it's not origami exactly, but kind of. Molecules are made up of little pieces that fit together based on physics, right? How they're attracted to each other or repelled by each other. And this click chemistry enables segments of molecules to click together like a seatbelt, that two ends just snap together. So it makes it a lot easier for researchers, for pharmaceutical developers, for all sorts of people working on a, a variety of different molecular chemical uh, solutions to problems, they're able to more easily put these molecules together. So the click chemistry has been very useful. That was Barry Sharpless and Morton Meldahl who, who spearheaded that research. However, Carolyn Bertozzi is the one who took it bioorthogonally. And that really means taking the, the click chemistry and applying it to uh, cells and figuring out where different molecules are in cells. And it could potentially contribute and is currently contributing to targeted cancer research and could lead to lots of other treatments for different diseases. So basically hmm. taking underlying aspects of chemistry, using them to, to our advantage and making it a little simpler. So I feel like yeah. so often the, the Nobel Prize is awarded to a new theory or method or something that has like, quote unquote, lots of promise for future application. But this is really mm. cool that they kind of did 
both. <laughs> yeah. They were like, here's this new new methodology. And also, here's how you can use it. And we already started doing that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So anyway, they, it's otherwise known as fun it's functional chemistry. It's chemistry that has that has function. It's gonna go do things. It's just, it's great. It's great. Anyway, moving on, because we could talk about this stuff all night long. Uh, the building blocks of things. Yes, we don't need to do that all night long. We can move on to physics. And the Nobel Prize in physics this year has been awarded to Hélène Aspect, John Clauser, and Anton Zeilinger. They, they demonstrated the potential to investigate and control particles that are entangled. So quantum entanglement got the, the physics Nobel Prize this year. This is really, um, this is an important area of physics as um, spooky at action at a distance has, was considered a possibility once upon a time. Einstein didn't think it really worked and then it did and then he lost a bet and, you know. He also discovered it. Which is also he kind of uh, it's right? sort of a there's a thing I discovered like Einstein was the first one to come up with a try to come up with crackpot physics to, to debunk disprove. an Einstein thing. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, ah, oh, my ideas are wrong. I can't this we gotta get rid of that. Yeah. But anyway, so this entanglement, the idea that particles can be connected over very lar large, long distances, this is laying the foundation for quantum communications, for crypto, uh, not crypto, for, um, uh, uh, well, maybe crypto stuff also for a blockchain type security, but security applications as well because of, uh, but anyway, really the information technology side of things is... Honestly, who knows where it's going to go? Like we can come up like like uh, Dr. Stephen Novella said last week. Like we can imagine as far as what we know currently in our real world, and it's the next iterations that will lead to the next creations, right? The next imaginings. Mm -hmm. But yes, so physics entanglement, and then, and then Justin, who got for? physiology or medicine and this doesn't really seem like it falls under physiology or medicine but it does it absolutely does so uh right. i'll just yeah. go ahead and do the final thing so there was yeah. a phd project in 1985 looking for dna in egyptian mummies it got published uh in the journal nature which is a pretty big coup for uh you know a phd project to to get published and then it was really soon after, it was called into question because its findings were likely just contamination uh, of modern DNA getting into the experiment. So the young researcher who authored it uh, gave up on science. No, no, they didn't. They didn't give up on science, actually, after the public failure, but instead refocused their efforts on developing techniques to minimize contamination during sampling and to be able to differentiate between uh, ancient molecules from modern ones. 37 years later, that young researcher is now being awarded with the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for his work on ancient DNA. Geneticist Svante Pabu, whose research uh, we have talked about quite a, quite a lot over the years, he was the first to successfully retrieve and sequence bits of ancient DNA from Neanderthals, uh, this is also back when sequencing was insanely difficult. Currently today, computers, servers bog down uh, to, to process the data to reconstruct genomes. Back then, they basically did it by hand. They had uh, post-it notes of <laughs> bits of sequence scattered out across the lab and were literally by hand trying to put bits together that, that seemed to overlap. Uh, they, uh, they went on to sequence Neanderthal genome in 2009, the complete genome. A year later, they did a, they did the complete Denisovan genome. So the, a lot of progress there. Pablo's interest in ancient DNA originated from childhood fascination with Egypt. He was a student at Uppsala University, which is, I believe, in Sweden. Shifted his focus from archaeology to medicine, following in the footsteps of his father, who 
was a biochemist who won the Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine. That's enough. You're cut off. No more. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like, no more in that family. No, yeah. but that's really spread the uh, wealth. <laughs> he got the first samples of Neanderthal bones from a museum in Germany and successfully got sequencing out of him, which was a huge deal back in 1997. And then went on to go and start to collect uh, things out in the, the bone fragments from a Siberian cave, which is what led to the Denisovan discovery. And he's gone on to do much, much more. Plus, uh, one of the things that was mentioned in, in talking about his contributions to science was that he himself initiated a lot of these techniques in lab, but yeah. there are spin-off labs and spin-off labs and departments at universities across uh, across the world that are now using his ancient DNA techniques uh, and and producing producing scientific papers and drugs. And it's a huge part of of what uh, we've covered on the show in yeah, terms a of. Lot. Of, yeah, of ancient DNA. So, yeah, so the genetic results also have offered some insights into modern human populations, showing some of the adaptations that current modern humans have as originating in our cousins. And I think that's where it really dives into Svante Pabo being given this Nobel Prize for physiology or medicine, that this has what he's discovered about what exists in our DNA from our ancient cousins, um, mm -hmm. it does have implications for human health. For instance, um, uh, immune responses of certain portions of the population are potentially dictated by some aspects of our Neanderthal DNA. There are other mm -hmm. DNA that uh, can impact certain people to have uh, higher risk of depression or anxiety. Um, there are, you know, there are issues. Fertility that, things that are fertility, linked to yeah. Neanderthal. Yeah. yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a ton of that. Uh, and also, also, most importantly, tremendous amount of content for this show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> most As importantly. Of the <laughs> techniques in recovering ancient DNA. Yeah. Which, yes, so very imp important. So okay, not ancient, but something brand new. Moving on from the Nobel Prizes, we would like to uh, congratulate all the scientists that have uh, been awarded these prestigious awards who will probably no longer be available for interviews on this show moving <laughs> forward because they're now famous. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, as always, just want to mention it would be nice to see more women in that list of awardees, of, of champions of science. But at least we had one in there. I'd... Yeah. Anyway, progress takes time. Justin, tell oh. us about the progress of uh, what we have learned about um, sharks versus orcas. I mean, honestly, uh, this is the grudge match to end all grudge matches, right? Well, you would think so, although it's it's exceedingly one-sided. Uh, Orca wins every time. Oh, basically, yeah, is how this works. Pretty much. Yep. But this is uh, this is interesting. There's this was uh, this is dramatic video out as part of a paper published in Ecological Society of America's journal Ecology. It shows orcas killing white sharks in South Africa. This is caught both by drone footage and by helicopter. Snippets of this I have seen, had seen uh, previously were, uh, were out on YouTube. It's, uh, some of the drone footage was released, a few minutes uh, of it anyway. Apparently they have hours of, of attacks uh, of orcas on sharks by the helicopter footage. And it's part of this paper that they have, they've published. Researchers believe that there may have been as many as three other sharks also killed around the same time of the footage. The clip of the uh, of this uh, hour-long hunt of multiple sharks in this paper is pretty amazing. Like immediately after watching this, I haven't seen anything in the paper that talked about this yet, but it's eerily similar to the uh, 
the white shark attacks by orca off the coast of California. It is, it is, ex- it's very interesting that the techniques these orcas are using seem to be the same. Uh, this says, uh, this behavior has never been witnessed in this detail before and certainly never from the air, said the lead author, Allison Towner, senior shark scientist, Marine Dynamics Academy in Gansby, South Africa. One of those whales was observed in new footage, uh, which is uh, one of the whales uh, that was observed was suspected of having killed sharks in the past. It had been at the sites of where sharks had been killed. But this is the first time they've actually seen the hunt uh, from the air. The, there's California footage out there of orcas with uh, that have already killed, made a kill on, on a great white. There is boat footage of an attack taking place, but it's from a boat, so you don't really have a very good video. This is a top-down video where you can really see it taking place. In the video, we see sharks attempt to evade capture by orcas. On uh, two cap- So what's happening is the, the orcas are circling, but the sharks are circling around the orca. They're staying close, and they're circling around them, and they're kind of in right. sync circling each other, one orca and one shark. What's interesting about this is this is the same evasion technique that seals and turtles use when a great white shark is approaching them. You try to stay close and keep an eye on them and keep circling out of the, you know, the kill zone of the mouth. The problem is orcas are social creatures. They hunt in packs. So what basically happens is the shark then is just staying in one place while another orca Hmm. comes into view and then uh, goes in for the kill. What's I what I found really fascinating is if you look at this video, it looks like the shark is being flipped onto its backside. Now, when a shark gets flipped onto its backside, it goes into a, a paralysis mode or a catatonic immobility mode, where a shark basically goes to sleep, puts up no. They don't resistance. move anymore. They're like stop Ugh. moving. It's yeah. rolled over on its back by the by the second orca, and then they uh, they remove its liver, devour that, oh, and off they go again. Gosh. Just go for the liver first. That's just I mean. So the liver apparently is high in nutrients, and, lots yeah. of fat, and and yeah. the orcas only have a a little bit of time to feed because the carcass then is going to start to sink, and there's all the little scavenger fish and everything else is going to start moving in, and the rest of the shark. It's just probably not as is is worth the time there. So amazing. Yeah. So what is also so what was very interesting was the witness that orca attack uh, uh, in California. They suspected that the orca there had been hunting rays off the co- coast of Baja Mexico. Rays are relatives of the sharks, and they have mm-hmm. the same catatonic state that they go into when they get flipped upside down. Because orcas don't go around flipping everything upside down. Mm -hmm. They do this. They've been seen doing this to sharks and to rays, which go into this catatonic state. So they thought, okay, this is a technique that was either that these orcas had either used or had learned from a pod that hunts rays. Because we know that orcas are are communal learners. They can share information. Uh, Either way, it's interesting because... This is this is many many. This is on a different continent, in another hemisphere, completely right. unrelated pod, doing this similar behavior. strategy, similar results, flipping to catatonic in a group hunting situation, and then eating the liver and, and being gone again. Well, we've um, we've seen in in other studies how whale song can move across the entire world over enough yeah. time, mm-hmm. and. Whales have been around for a while. <laughs> Sharks have been around even longer than that. So it's it's possible that this originated in one place, but even with that, it could travel socially across the whole planet. It could, but I don't know how much, because here's the thing, though. Orcas pods tend to be very specific types of hunters. Like you can have, uh, you can have orca in the same region. Some are going after plucking tuna off of uh, fishing hooks uh, and and some don't go after tuna at all right some but they will... weren't but they weren't eating the shark for food 
They were just getting the liver and scooting. But that's right? food. That's food. That's yes, eat. but it's not the same as picking off fish or having a specialization in a particular. This is a specialized task. This is yeah. not just them eating sharks. Oh, I think right. it is. Oh, that's interesting. It's an interesting interpretation, Blair. I think another I... point that we have also seen from the Puget Sound whales, orca pods, is that you have the pods that are locals who just stay in Puget Sound and really don't move out of it very much. And then you ha and those are more of the fish eaters that we're aware of in Puget Sound. And then you have the migrant pods. And the, those pods come from Alaska. They come from a, a broad region. And they're more of the mammal eaters. So the there's also interesting questions, I think, as to the, like Blair was talking about, the traveling pods, the the interaction between different mm -hmm. pods, and then maybe the learning that takes place between them. And there are definitely going to be situations because of mating, these pods don't just stay together. Mm -hmm. There has to be genetic mixing. And so you have individuals that, especially the males, that head on out to find new pods and places to live, and they take their, take their knowledge with them. And yeah, also think thing. about like if your two options are eating fish or or marine mammals for the most part, right? Yeah. What is a shark? It's a fish. In size though, what's it like? A marine mammal. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's got sharp teeth, teeth if it's a great white. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So but, but it really doesn't seem to be a problem. So here's another here's another thing that uh, that overlapped between the California and the uh, South African attacks. They had, uh, they had a bunch of boats and, you know, when they put the people in the little cage underneath and they were doing all this shark spotting in the area. And they'd seen, uh, they'd been, they'd seen sharks every day during their surveys. Uh, there was several sharks spotted the days of these attacks. However, in the 45 days after the, the predation events, they only saw a single white shark uh, anywhere in that area. <laughs> They left the region, the white, great Jesus. white sharks en masse left the region. And this is how this happened in California, too. When they when they saw the orcas attacking sharks off the coast of Monterey, the great whites left the coast of California and were gone for, again, like I think a month or two. They didn't so come back. So so there's some and yeah. they I, they believe it's preservation. A, it's good. The chemical <laughs> of. A, a, a shark uh, being eviscerated in this way is enough to alert all the other sharks in the region. They have, they smell really good, I guess, or have a good sense of smell. At least I, I've never smelled a shark. They, shark. there's an apex predator yeah. that's killing one of the apex predators. We should just all flee immediately. And that's what they yeah. do. That's, that's yep. the, they just run. All I can say swim. is, whether you're a shark or a human, don't trust the orcas. Mm -mm. The orcas. Mm -mm. Nope. Nope. Don't trust them. But I think it but, also brings into question the some of the communal learning. Because if they're doing this different hemisphere, different continent, far away, same techniques, they can just figure it out wherever they are. They don't necessarily have the pod that was attacking off the coast, the, the shark off the coast of California didn't necessarily have to learn it from ones that were flipping rays in Baja. You don't know that though. Been They've been around we don't know thousands any of this. and thousands yeah. and thousands and thousands of years. You don't know this just happened. And it's also been seen in New Zealand. So what I'm saying it's a global uh it's a global technique. It's a it's a global shark flipping cabal. That's yeah, is, this I'm, is what it is. It brings up like a genetic memory thing too, or is it just an innovative thing? Yeah, I mean, it, I it's, no what's idea. instinct that's versus memory question. versus yeah. it's With a orcas, technique that's probably, only being used on one type though. of prey that's susceptible yeah. to it. Very interesting. But Blair, humans are going to be susceptible to a greater predator at some point. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Let's please not call AI a predator. That is the last thing that AI needs to hear. Shh, don't listen. <laughs> Um, so this is a study looking at AI to help scientists, whale scientists, do their research. They use machine learning. Uh, this is a team from the Australian Antarctic Division. 
the K. Lisa Yang Center for Conservation Bioacoustics at Cornell University and Curtin University. They all trained an algorithm to detect blue whale D calls in sound recordings. And they found that the AI had greater accuracy and speed than human experts. So um, technology, this technology will allow scientists to more easily analyze hundreds of thousands of hours of recordings of uh, these whales to better understand trends in populations, mainly as they recover from the catastrophe that is and was whaling. Still a problem. <laughs> yeah. um, so D calls I mentioned are the social calls made by male and female whales on feeding grounds. They are not like songs, which have a regular and predictable pattern. D calls are highly variable across individual whales and across seasons and across years. And therefore, it makes it really hard for people to identify the calls unless they have a really well-trained ear. And therefore, it makes automation of the recording analysis way harder because there's such little consistency. So they trained the algorithm. They had a library of about 5,000 decals. They captured 2,000 hours of sound recorded in sites in the wild. And they had six different human analysts go through and identify or an annotate the decals. And then rather than analyzing the sound, they turned the sounds into spectrograms or visual representations of the call and had the algorithm train itself to identify the calls from 85% of the data. And then they used the, the remaining 15% to validate itself and improve. So basically like, here's the pattern. This is what it looks like. And then use this 15% to figure out how you can identify it and get better as you look at each one, right? That's how AI learns. Um, so then they wanted to test it. They gave them a test data set of 187 hours and um, an independent human judge <laughs> determined um, when there were disagreements between the humans and the AI, which one was right. So still it came down to a human judge, but this was an expert. The AI found about 90% of the calls and the human found about 70. And what's more, exciting is that it took about 10 hours for humans to annotate the test data set, but took the AI guess. How long? Minute. Minute. 30 seconds. Oh, less than a minute. Jeez. 1200 yeah. times faster. So they've made their AI available to other whale researchers around the world, which is great to train that AI on whale sounds and soundscapes. And of course, to then later use it. And so their next step is to build a more uh, build more recording sites, build bigger recording networks, then be able to go through that data en masse to develop a long-term monitoring project to look at trends in blue whales and other species. So in this case, it's not quite putting researchers out of a job so much as speeding up their collection process quite a bit. For now. But so again, isn't, so isn't that isn't that getting into the, the, you're speeding up the collection process, but then it's going to get into that forever problem of now they have so much data to yeah. deal with. <laughs> well, well, I guess actually it's not speeding up the collection. It's speeding up the analysis. So I guess at yeah, one point yeah. you'll run headfirst into a wall of, I have no more data to look at, but that means right. then right. you can draw conclusions and write papers. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. And, and, and so we've, we've been trying to decipher, uh, whale language. There's been, uh, dreams of one day being able to communicate on a more sentient level with whales. True. We may not be the ones to do it. Oh yeah. It'll be the AI for sure. So, so the AI yeah. can, uh, if it can, uh, and analyze, oh. maybe it can also then talk just don't whale. tell the Maybe ai about whaling do not tell the ai about uh, whaling you don't know no, it's already got whale. access to the internet it knows it knows every filthy human secret this ai doesn't have access to the internet yet yeah they will eventually <laughs> or it's just not telling you it's just not telling you. when it goes on that server what do you think it does in the downtime you think it took a whole 30 seconds no, it took 10 seconds. The other 20 seconds, it was watching YouTube Surfing videos. Surfing the internet, right? <laughs> <laughs> and at a really fast speed, too. The uh, So then what do, what do we do when the AI begins to have direct communication with the whales and finds it to be them to be as intelligent and interesting as us? Why, why would it prefer, uh, preference human intelligence to interact with? 
The whales will point. use the AI to to interpret our sounds. Don't yeah. let the orcas have yeah. the AI. <laughs> the AI won't have any sort of preferential decision. Like, oh, I like this intelligent life form versus that one that I can analyze and break down the communications and talk to in some Turing-esque fashion. Why not talk to the whales? Hey, you know what? I'm going to uh, focus on birds. Uh, it's equally as long as humans. I think the future could be uh, actually the opposite of dystopian. What would it like a non-dystopian AI that's like, I'm going to preference all nature's needs and wants. Oh, that would be dystopian, wouldn't it? That would be, oh gosh. For, for humans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you know, it depends on what animals get in first. It just, it just depends your perspective. Uh, bring me all the How many cups of coffee have you had, Justin? That's what I want to know. Cause... This is a good question. <laughs> <laughs> How much cold medicine? Do they actually sell cold medicine in Denmark? There's no medicine in Denmark. They don't allow anybody to have painkillers or cold medicine or anything. You, or fire extinguishers. You can't buy fire That's where my family, the Scandinavia, no, that's no. where my grandmother got it. No, you fight through it. Anyway. But, Moving on from AI, it's, it's let's jump into AT. Like, oh, I have a terrible headache. Take a headache pill. No. Okay, from AI, let's jump into ATP. Where did ATP come from? Where do you think? The ATP mitochondria. <laughs> right, right, mitochondria. They the powerhouse of the cell. Yes, this is what we know. Yeah. <laughs> when we know that there's this cool chemical reaction that uses ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and adds a phosphate, and it uses ATP to power the process to create more ATP. And it actually takes like six ATP to create a new ATP. Like there's like there's one electron at a time or something going yeah, on. Yeah, one electron yeah. at a time. Yes, exactly, Justin. And the whole process is it it's a lot. And so some researchers were like, hey, we want to know exactly where ATP came from. And they're like, yeah, it's got to be a pretty simple answer because and then they're like, whoa, this is circular. Where did the ATP come from to start the process to make the ATP? Because it has to be in there somewhere. Anyway, a few years ago, they uh, had a study where they uh, determined that there was some very interesting prebiotic uh, chemistry going on. And they looked at a two-carbon compound called acetylphosphate, ACP. And this ACP, ACP is present today in bacteria, in archaea, as uh, archaeobacteria, and it's a metabolic intermediate. And so it's also been shown to phosphorylate ADP to ATP in water, but only when there are iron ions present. And so they went, hmm, let's look at what we've seen in this old stuff and really dig into it and try and do the disproving all the other alternatives process. And what they did is they did a lot of experiments to explore all the various questions that got to the bottom of it. And yes, indeed, what they're able to infer is that in prebiotic life, the process that led to the, uh, the arrival of ATP was not just ADP phosphorylation that you had to have a very specific set of conditions, water, iron ions, and this ACP, acetylphosphate. And the acetylphosphate and another, uh, and, and phosphate ions then could work together to catalyze ATP formation. And it's the only way it works. And it has a just right chemistry. And it's only when you have water, and iron, acetylphosphate, and other phosphate ions. And they only, and it's, would, a, it's, very, it's a very just right geometry. Where would you find that? You would find that in hot volcanic pools. Um, you would find that in ooze. primordial ooze, deep uh, under sea vents, the hot deep under sea vents, places where iron would be coming up out of uh, the rich crust. Yeah. Which is also ding, ding, one ding. of those uh, prevailing theory ideas of uh, how life started, too. That's. Uh, Benefits. Yeah. yeah, so it's a very, I don't know, very in exciting uh, open access paper, uh, prebiotic basis for ATP as the universal energy currency. 
It only happened in a special time in a special place on our special planet, and the paper is in PLOS Biology this last week. And I think you brought up a, a story recently, Kiki, or, or maybe it was uh, a number of decades ago, about the thermal vents, uh, the clay, uh, sort mm. of the porousness of the clay being able to trap my, uh, sort of micro environments uh, in it that yeah. would allow not only if this process is taking place, but sort of create the uh, analog of a cell structure to contain uh, yeah. uh, these things. So, yeah. It, and it's... suddenly you have an energetic enzyme, this, you know, this, you got this, uh, not enzyme, ener energetic molecule that when broken down releases a ton of energy and then other mm -hmm chemicals molecules in that little tiny micro cell are like woo, let's take advantage of this and then it's like let's make rna and let's make dna and woo, we're so fancy and we're multicellular and all of a sudden we're on land Whee! and then we got eaten by an orca boom yes <laughs> this is the history of life in my brain and moving <laughs> on from that aside from being in, uh, I don't know, maybe scared of orcas, we should be afraid of asteroids like the one that killed the dinosaurs. Justin, what did this asteroid, <laughs> what did it do to our planet? So it, 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 it's famous for having killed the nearly all the dinosaurs, but it yeah. also killed three quarters of the planet's plants and other animal species, fish included. Like it killed most of everything. Uh, that was on the planet. Dinosaurs were just the biggest, most reliant on the food web at the end of the day. But it, uh, according to this uh, research here out of uh, University of Michigan led, led the study, uh, it also triggered a tsunami with mile-high waves that churned ocean floors thousands and thousands of miles away from the impact site on Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. This is a study is published in the journal AGU Advances in a global simulation of the impact tsunami. In uh, they they were reviewed geological records at more than a hundred sites worldwide, found evidence that supported their models predictions of the tsunami's path and power. So basically, what they are looking at is soil sediments at the bottom of seas and oceans, and if there is a disturbance at around the the KP mass extinction uh, event, which closed out the Cretaceous period. They say, aha, this looks like it has been uh, part of that massive tsunami that disturbed the sea floor when it rolled through the world's oceans. So powerful was this. The, the study authors calculated the initial ener energy in the tsunami was 30,000, let me say that again, 30,000 times larger than the energy in the December 2004 Indian Ocean earthquake tsunami, which killed more than 230,000 people and was one of the largest, most destructive tsunamis uh, in modern record. The team simulations show that the impact tsunami radiated mainly to the east and northeast into the North Atlantic Ocean, and to the southwest through the Central American Seaway, which used to separate uh, North and South America into the to get into the Pacific Ocean. Oh, this thing is, by the way, do you, do you guys know how big this thing is? The the asteroid that became the area that, that slammed into us? It was, it, was a, it was big. Yeah, uh, according to this, it was 14 kilometers in diameter or 8.7 miles. This thing was massive. That's massive. This is really big. And it was moving at about 20. That was the sound it made, too. It was moving yeah. at about 27,000 miles per hour when it struck. Anyway, they looked at all this. They, they did a, a couple of simulations that showed these massive mile-high waves, tsunami waves, that created a ring shape, propagated outward. They kind of looked at what their modeling said it would go. And then they compared it to seafloor records. And it's a pretty good, uh, they found a pretty good match. According to the team simulations, one hour after impact, the tsunami had spread outside of the Gulf of Mexico into the North Atlantic. Four hours after the impact, 
waves had passed through the Central American Seaway into the Pacific. 24 hours after impact, waves had crossed most of the Pacific from the east and most of the Atlantic from the west and entered the Indian Ocean from both sides. And 48 hours after impact, significant tsunami waves had reached most of the world's coastlines. <sighs> big waves, big waves. That's a lot. So yeah. Most of they think the open ocean wave heights would have been about 328 feet, which isn't quite a mile, but that's that's a in open ocean. When those come on shore, as as we know, waves they come on shore, they 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 gain in height. So these were massive. They're not even they they know that this like scoured the the bottoms of a bunch of the world's ocean, uh, which researchers have been finding for years. Like you know, this seems all jumbled up here. There's stuff missing here. They found it out as far as New Zealand. New Zealand had this whole theory of plate tectonics was involved and why their seafloor disruption from uh, certain ages was was hard to figure. Oh, well, looks like it actually fits quite well with this model. New Zealand's coast got affected by this giant tsunami. They don't even know. This, this was just looking at the ocean floor. So they haven't even really looked at or researched yet what the onshore effects would be. How much erosion? Hey, maybe, uh, you know, maybe the Earth had a lot more land once upon a time. You put a mile-high tsunami everywhere, and some of it might uh, be gone. Was one hmm. aspect of this uh, th this study, though, is not, not the land masses where they are today, because this was 66 million years ago, right? So this is land masses. This is kind of going back in time to where mm -hmm. the land masses were at that period in time, and then doing the modeling based off of what we've seen with our land masses today. So it's like this so, taking from today, going backwards in time and putting it all together and kind of forensically figuring it out with their model. Yeah. I don't know that I don't know that it's changed that much. Okay. So things were scrunched a little closer together. Yeah. Uh, the Atlantic yeah. side. Pacific Ocean was bigger. Atlantic Ocean mm -hmm. side, things were closer, but you can still see eh, kind of the outlines of a lot of the a lot of things. Let me see if I've got the right year on this map that I'm trying to see here. I want to see a Cretaceous. I'm also period. wondering if um, this is why we find fossils of sea creatures in the middle of the desert. <laughs> <laughs> Part of it, it no. got sloshed <laughs> onto land. <laughs> <laughs> so no, 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 All because I, I mean, I, I don't think that's right. Uh, I think those are just reclaimed worse sea land now. Or uh, of course, I mean land, that's uh, that's the oceans. party line. I'm just saying this is an extra piece <laughs> right. that we have not considered but, in that. No, we haven't. But I, uh, I think it would have been. It, yeah, well, I guess it's possible because if it's moving that much ocean floor on the yep. land and depositing it. You could sweep could up some like invertebrates. You could, yeah, then, absolutely. It all depends on where it is in the, the strata, right? The timelines of everything. The strata would be all this messed does, up. Yeah. yeah, but this does all fall in line kind of with the uh, the hypothesis about the one location in, what, the North Dakota that they've been working on for years where the fish are all jumbled up and there's, yes. you know, there are volcanic bits of glass and like all sorts of pieces mm -hmm. of asteroid little like everything is a big mushy mess and they said well there's this this riverbed this you know river system that a big tsunami wall of mud just pushed right on through it and that's what they've been talking about and so mm -hmm. this is now really modeling what that would have been yeah. like yeah. yeah yeah big bada wave crazy stuff Oy, okay, moving on from... Oh, oh so yeah, oh, that dart mission. Do you mission. have more for this one? No, no, I'm, I'm done, but that dart mission now sounds really important. Mm -hmm. I was that the whole same running thing. into an <laughs> asteroid and seeing if you yeah. get it. Hey, try it on that little one, but boy, if there's one eight miles across, uh, it can do a mile-high tsunami around the globe. Yeah. Uh, we should probably do something about it. Yeah. You know, I'm looking at the maps right now. This is just a total Hard to aside. find a good map. I just I'm looking at a good map right now, so I have to I have to bring it up here. And it's a 
a very interesting period of time when North and South America were not connected, which I think mm -hmm. is very interesting in our interpretations also of what exactly happened and how that would have uh, mm. influenced the reverberations of the impact. And so in the, <sighs> in the modeling, that is, um, that's part of it. Huh. Very, very interesting. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the paper is available through the associate uh, AGU publication. Oh, just go to our website. There's a link. Yeah, we'll have the we'll have the link. You can click it. Da, da, da. Click it. Very exciting. Like those molecules. Anyway, <laughs> click, click, click. Okay. Now moving on to a story about cancer. And I, Justin, I think you brought something up about this recently. Um, researchers have been investigating um, other, my, other species of cells within our cancer tumors. And this week in Cell, uh, the journal Cell, there were a couple of studies that were published that specifically looked at the existence of fungi within tumors. They, uh, one study was uh, released on the 29th. They dusted for the genetic fingerprints of fungi in 35 different cancer types by looking at more than 17,000 tissue, blood, and plasma samples from cancer patients. They didn't all test positive for fungus, which implies that sometimes there might have been, uh, because these were samples collected broadly and were publicly avail available databases means there might have been some amount of fungal contamination in some of the samples. But what it does suggest mm. is that um, they did find fungi in all three can all 35 cancer types that they assessed. So there were fungal cells in all 35 of them. And uh, this group out of the Weizmann Institute of Science in Rehovot, Israel, uh, said that they estimated they have one fungal cell for every 1,000 to 10,000 cancer cells. And so when you think about a tumor being about a billion or so cancer cells, you've got a significant proportion of, you know, not huge, but there's a significant proportion of fungal cells that are in there. We know also that fungal cells are kind of found to interact with bacterial cells in our bodies. We don't know exactly what's going on there, this is where there's this other sec this second cell study that looks specifically at gastrointestinal, lung, and breast tumors. And this study, they found that uh, in each of those, three cancer types tended to host fungal genuses Candida, Blastomyces, and Malassezia, respectively. So kind of the different tumors seemed to be favored by or seemed to create environments that favored specific fungal genuses. And so the question now is, are the fungi responsible in some way for the tumors? Or is it an environment in the body that is conducive to the growth of funguses? And that's in the question of, especially when we find them working in conjunction with bacterial cells, what's going on there that is creating that little environment? But then you know, if fungi are driving poorer outcomes or making cancers more aggressive, if we can then treat the fungi, then that might also aid in the treatment of the cancers themselves. Hmm. Not so simple. Not so simple. It's just, it's fascinating to think that, you know, you think, I mean, we talk all the time about our microbiome and all the cells, but you think of it as like, oh, they're just in my gut or, you know, these microbial, you know, I inhale them sometimes, but of course I just, you know, spit them right back out in my mucus. But no, I mean, you get, we get these fungi, these bacteria, they are in us. And so sometimes they end up places they shouldn't be. And what does that do? So these are very interesting questions that will help us moving forward, especially as, you know, Fungi. Fungi are the future, everyone. Yeah. yeah Dave Gillespie, I think, is making a good uh, point in the chat room. Fungus and tumors is, ex is expected. Tumors modulate the immune system, allowing them to evade detection. Funguses hide out there. It could it could be something just, just like that, where, you know, there's uh, the cancer cells are uh, living in a rogue state, and they're not taking out the trash. Yep. And so you get an mm -hmm. accumulation. Because funguses are... 
they get into the blood system, they get around in within the body. That's they they're they're gonna be in there. So the the causational the That's idea behind it yet. Yeah. is not shown. It's intriguing because there's nothing more terrifying than the idea that all funguses can give you cancer. Not like, hmm. ah, no more things that give cancer. Stop. You got to put a limit on it somewhere. Yeah. Well, but if it's affecting uh, yeah. aggressiveness or outcomes, things like that, it'd be, it, I'd be much more, uh, this is, is if it sounds to me like, forget all of that. You now have, if you have preferential fungi showing up in certain types of tumors, you now have a drug delivery system. That's you now have very interesting. Yep. You yep. now have you know how now you now have uh, an, an invited guest into the enemy camp. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very that's a very interesting point. Yeah, but it's it's this is as as, as you were sharing from Dave and uh, talking about, you know, this is, this is your immune system. We know that if you can get the uh, HPV vaccine, that's going to stop a virus from, you know, starting a cancer. And so there, you know, this is, our body is working with the stuff in our environment all the time. We just want to figure out how it works with the stuff in our environment so we can be healthier longer. But one of the things that makes us happier longer is drinking good beer. At least some of us, not everybody. Not everybody likes good beer. Some people like bad beer. So, but researchers, microbiologists, have been trying to make beer better. Did you know that in the 1970s, when a lot of the large-scale manufacturing of beer led to using large closed vessels, these cans that are pressurized, um, for brewing large volumes of of beer that it changed the flavor of Dude, so so <laughs> i didn't realize that I, I mean i didn't realize that we were we were brewing beer in open air containers up until was, the 1970s that's actually the surprising part yeah so the exciting part is that yeah uh we were brewing beers in big open vats Beer was, you know, Belgian beers and other beer, big open vats. We were just letting that natural carbonation take place. But these closed vessels led to higher amounts of carbonation, which is great because you have wouldn't go flat flavor, wouldn't yeah. go flat. But it also, because of the higher amount of carbonation, it makes it not taste as good because the molecules that affect flavor are also affected by the carbonation. Huh. So these microbiologists have been looking, trying to uh, get their, uh, find bacteria or yeast species that might be more con conducive to better beer flavor in these carbonated situations. And so what they have uh, discovered is that, well, I mean, I think this is a personal kind of thing because, I don't know, some people like Boddington's and that kind of banana-ish flavor that you get with, like, a good Boddington's. But apparently, banana flavor is quality for beer. And I don't know that I agree with this. Ew! <laughs> but one of the flavor profiles is banana -ish. Absolutely not. No. Cancel. No. Cancel it. Yeah, I know. Reject I know the science. What... Re revoke yeah, like, revoke their these, doctrine. I don't want it anymore. This is are not these acceptable. researchers are these researchers over seventy years old and are like, no. oh, I haven't had a good beer since before nineteen seventy. <laughs> like, who's <laughs> judging? And that's, this is probably sours or something. Anyway, it's not even a hoppy beer like you get in California. So, no. yeah, uh, the the idea that everybody who likes beer in the last fifty years doesn't know what a good beer tastes like. Could end up being like the old beard was terrible. Yeah, you just make <laughs> me so the, sad. At like, least to the modern palate, right? Banana. Banana flavor oh, doesn't banana. sound. 
Yeah, so um, what they have discovered is a single Pop mutation disease. in a gene yeah. called the MDS3 gene, which codes for a regulator apparently involved in the production of isoamyl acetate, which is the source of banana-like flavor that is... And this mutation in this gene is also responsible for pressure tolerance in the yeast strain. So they're looking at, they have, they did use CRISPR-Cas9 to put this mutated MDS3 gene into other yeast species. And so more banana flavor and better pressure tolerance for beer. I really hope that they find some other genes because I don't mm -mm. like the banana flavor. Mm -mm. I don't mm -mm. Mm -mm. But, but mm -hmm. you know, but, uh, for you all know, the Boddington's you... lovers out there, I just I, I I apologize. But you but you don't know how it fits into the overall flavor profile. Once it, <sighs> I mean, like, would you drink tobacco flavor wine? I probably you probably not. have had yeah, maybe and and liked yeah. it because because it's. <laughs> When they, when no, they, but uh, banana, it's it, it, once, once something tastes like banana, it only tastes like banana, and everything you eat before and no, after tastes it, like it banana. Might, it might be much more subtle than that. It might be much, much more subtle. It, they're not putting bananas in the beer, although you could probably get those now because they're making all but kinds it's like, of weird fruity this beers. Is, this is coming from the idea that like a beer should taste kind of like not exactly fruity, but like have have a. Um, a fruit adjacent taste, but there's this whole other world of beers that tastes almost like tea. That's herbal, yeah. like hoppy, right? Yeah. Like what you were saying, Justin, but like, it's a completely those, different world. Yeah, but it, it is, herbal beers. It is, but then the malts might have a chocolate, uh, uh, aspect to them or something. Like that. So there's, there's a lot of flavor compounds that and, if, and the, all if these flavors, not can we make isolated, them you might not even recognize. Like, so it's, I'd be I don't know if they need to, to be stronger. It. That's the other thing that I think is crazy. Like it, if you look at what adult beverages are popular right now, mm. it's like white claw. It's like a beverage that's basically water with a whisper of a taste in it. Right. Nobody said American adults had any sense of taste. So, yeah. No, but so that's what, what I'm saying is like generally from, from what from where do we <laughs> decide cool that it. more taste is better? <laughs> more taste is not necessarily better. Uh, well, I love the idea of trying to recover an ancient uh flavor uh flavor profile. Yeah, which was created <laughs> to mask the barely drinkable water that the beer was made out of because that was safer than drinking actual water. And I'm sure it tasted terrible. So they were like, how we need to cover up this taste. <laughs> well, but no, but, I, but, but like, but like people, they were talking 1970s. Like, is it, was it everywhere? Because does that mean like people drinking a can of beer or watching the, uh, the football game in the 1960s, that that beer was brewed in an open uh, vessel? Like, More likely. now I'm curious, like, how, how, uh, you know. Well, think about how ale was made during the Renaissance, right? Like, You're talking have... about the Renaissance. I know, but I'm, but I'm pre saying it's, it was it was the a time-honored tradition. I know it for you. It continued on. I know don't, for you Don't children. make an age joke. Nope. I nope. know for you millennials. Nope. The 1970s and nope. the medieval era seem like they could have been at the same time, but there's a... But the one, so the one, the one thing that we're also uh, forgetting is so the advent of cans, aluminum cans for the canning of beer, but there's also the vessels that the actual brewing so takes brewing. place in, and so yeah. now we've got like the big, big vats, right? But they they're, look like they're giant capped. cans, yeah. <laughs> they're big giant cans, not yeah. little cans, <laughs> big cans. Yeah. Also, I have to say, all of this is just uh, unnecessary steps. We can we can have uh, you could have just done this with the, the the flavor molecules being produced in yeast, without having a, a yeast that produces it. You could have just said, ah, we'll just have this thing, and then we'll add it into the, the beer layer. You can make any flavor profile that way now. Oh hey, did we just get raided over on Twitch? Thank Greylark. Yeah, we don't want to drink the White Claw. Well, maybe I will this summer. It's, it's a summer drink anyway. Banana beer. Have no fear. Banana beer is here, everyone. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and this is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode. We are happy that you are here wherever you're joining us, uh, whether you are watching us live on YouTube, Twitch, or on Facebook. That is wonderful. Or if you are listening to us right now as a podcast, thank you for being a part of our audience. We just absolutely appreciate you being here. If you love the show, please tell a friend today. Right now, we're going to come on back to that previously known part of the show as the COVID update, which I don't really want to think of it as the COVID update anymore, okay? COVID's over. COVID's <laughs> over, according to everybody except COVID. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> so what we're potentially, what I, what I am proposing here is that we are moving into the preparing for the future segment okay. of the show where we have scientific stories that give us some kind of technology or science understanding of you know how we can maybe survive some of these infectious diseases viruses microbes in the future and my uh, my my story for this particular section has to do with far ultraviolet LED lights. We all love LED lights. LED lights are fantastic. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'll stop sharing that particular screen. I don't need to do that anymore. But yes, far LED lights. Far LED lights are interesting because we all know LEDs. LEDs have started to very strongly replace fluorescence and traditional light bulbs for efficiency all around. They're in your and, ring light for your TikToks. <laughs> yes. I mean, I've got a ring light right now. There's LEDs all up in there. Yes. LEDs are fantastic. The particular type of LED, the frequency of the light, however, we have learned can be used to sanitize. We know that ultraviolet light, the sun, mm -hmm. lots of ultraviolet light, kills bugs, right? Mm -hmm. Kills viruses, kills microbes. It's fantastic. However, it also leads to uh, mutations in those under layers of our skin that are very important so that we end up with problems like skin cancer. So you can't have the sanitizing LED, ultraviolet LED lights in the same place as you have people. And very often you can have the uh, the LED lights in some kind of an air filtration system, an HVAC system. It can be used for hospitals, hotels, for big in installations very often. But what if you just want to have these far LED lights maybe at, uh, out at an event? Maybe you want to have them available where, you know, where just about anybody can, uh, you know, have the light shine down upon them, right? If you're in an event, you want to clean the air potentially, you don't want to hurt people. So Japanese researchers at Riken University have been working on this problem, balancing the issue of the specific frequency of the light with the efficiency of the light itself. So the power usage and the light that's given out by the LED. And they've gotten to a pl place where they have significantly increased their output. They have found a way to make a frequency of far ultraviolet light with their LED setup that does not harm humans, but does kill microbes. Very good. Very yes. good. Yes. And they are convinced that they will be able to have further improvements to their technology. And so in a very reasonable amount of time, you know, not like tomorrow, but in a reasonable amount of time, we will be seeing these kinds of technological solutions to some of our sanitation needs. Now, you don't you wouldn't want to replace all light bulbs with this because right. some microbes are good so <laughs> you don't destroy <laughs> all microbes however like it would be cool if for example you had a switch in your in your bathroom you could flip on the uv switch after you take a shower to so the mold wouldn't grow in your shower right. that would be great right it would be um, wonderful you have or you have a uh, a far far ultraviolet led light that just you turn on in your bathroom um maybe you know it's your your friends go in there you go in there. yeah you just, maybe i could just keep your bathroom air clean mm -hmm, seems mm -hmm. great to me Everyone's airplanes home. movie theaters Ooh, i could yes. go on <laughs> the list goes on yeah um your toothbrush so, anyway <laughs> 
Yeah. So the idea is they're working on the chemistry of the situation, different proportions of aluminum with little bits of silicon, magnesium, and uh, working on their technology. We'll see where it goes. We'll see where it goes. But future, future proof ourselves. What can we do for the future? So on occasion, this, this section of the show will be back. Yeah. Because COVID's over, everybody. <laughs> I would love to see. It. Can they put that in all of the touch screens that we have to use in public now? Yeah, that would be fantastic. Backlit them. Yes. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty smart. Thank that you. Would be wonderful. Oh, I'm but enough that about now. enough late. about technology. I think it's it's time for us to move on to another part of the show that's much more soft and cuddly. Is it, I don't know if it's soft and cuddly mm. today. Maybe a little soft and cuddly? Some of it's soft. I don't know if it's cuddly. We'll talk about it. Round with claws and teeth. Yes, it's time for Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair! She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels and a boat What you got, Blair? Well, I'm going to start with the bad news and then we can have some fun after that. Okay. <laughs> so, yet another impact of climate change. No surprise. Uh, last week, we, uh, Justin brought a story about how climate change is impacting birds in general. Today, I wanted to bring a short story about the red kite which is a, uh, a UK bird um, that, uh, that, you know, ha has had some trouble. They're a bird of prey, and birds of prey have, have had a rough century, I will say. <laughs> um, however, assessments made between 2005 and 2019 classified them as near-threatened, but in 2020, they were bumped up to least concern. So their population is growing throughout huge swaths of the UK and they're doing better and better. Um, there's many being reintroduced to parts of England and Scotland. That's been going on since 1989. DDT is not around. I'm sure that has something to do with it. Um, mm. Hunting them has been outlawed. There's all sorts of things that has helped bring these birds of prey back. But a new study wanted to look at how climate change could pose a new risk to the red kite that's a bit of a hidden threat because it's actually the longitudinal impact of droughts when they are chicks so th what they found was that drought conditions which obviously restrict water food and therefore nutrition specifically for babies that forces animals to work harder to meet their basic needs, to remain healthy. And if they are babies, it makes it harder for them to grow big and strong. So they were able to look at data from as far back as 1970 to look at how the red kites hatched during drought did later on. They had tagged nestlings with unique leg rings and monitored them over many, many years. So they were really able to see if you were born in a drought year, does that impact you for the rest of your life? It does. Some chicks born during a drought year continue to face the consequences of malnutrition throughout their adult life. It might be because they were permanently impaired in their development um, due to a failure to meet nutritional needs. That makes them smaller. It makes them more vulnerable to disease or predation, less capable of hunting, less capable of fighting mates. There's lots of things that can come with just being smaller than most of your species. So why do I bring this up other than to just be like, yeah, climate change is, is at it again. <laughs> it's because uh, this is an example, and I talk about this with sea turtles all the time, of there just being so many pressures on a species that one more is too many. So as I mentioned, red kites were previously considered vermin. So um, they, they weren't just being hunted for sport, but they were also being hunted and picked off by gamekeepers and farmers. They were shot, they were poisoned, they were trapped um, because they thought that they were harmful to livestock and to game. Um, it's, they're still being illegally hunted that way. The numbers are much, much lower because it is illegal. But 
um, this is still a problem. As well as being hunted, they also will, uh, will get poisoned because they feed on animal carcasses. So this will be accidental. There will be environmental poisons. An animal will die. They'll go, oh, look, an easy meal. And they will eat that dead animal and they will get secondarily poisoned from mice, rats, whatever, for toxic substances and poisons that are put out for those individuals. They also have problems with wind turbines. And so on top of all of that, the more frequent and severe droughts as a result of climate change support the idea that this could be a really big impact because it's just one more thing on a stressed population. So recognizing that, there's things you can do. <laughs> um, of course, there's lots that we can do to help as a community turn the tide on climate change in general. But what conservationists can do that are working directly with the red kites is if they know that a drought year is coming, then they can actually put shade over nests. They can provide extra water in the area, and then they can potentially push back against the negative impact of that drought that could last for an entire generation. So this is an, this is an interesting situation where like, just because an animal goes off the endangered species list, <laughs> doesn't mean you can take your hands off the wheel kind of thing because there's still lots of other pressures on these species. And um, this is an excellent example of studying a species since the 1970s. You can really see how they they were doing way better and then climate change reared its so head. Yeah, and now it's time to kind of get back to business. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, honestly, the work of not just watching one species, but maybe looking at a species like this as we look at others as indicators mm -hmm. for ecosystems, right? If ecosystems are being impacted by climate change, then yes. much, much more than just this species are going to be yeah. downstream getting, you know, getting the brunt of it. Absolutely. So it's, yeah. a, it's a big job. If we want to be stewards if we want to, you know, oh, we're going to grow our food. We're going to do this stuff. We're going to, oh, yeah, we're taking care of that. We, like, we really have to take care of it. Yes. Yep. <laughs> Try it. Yeah, absolutely. And now on to some fun news. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, do you want to hear about chimps and gorillas playing together in the wild? Yes, please. Yeah. What? This is a long-term study from Washington University in St. Louis. St. Louis, I guess. I like St. Louis better. <laughs> anyway, um, this reveals the first evidence of lasting social relationships between chimps and gorillas in the wild. Yes, there have already been observations and documentation of social ties between chimpanzees and gorillas. But that's basically just because their habitats overlap a lot. So they're in the same area a lot of the time. But in this research, looking at over 20 years of observations at, and I'm going to get this wrong, and I am so sorry, <laughs> Nuwabale Nadoki National Park in Republic of Congo, um, the researchers documented these social ties, not just between chimps and gorillas, but between individuals of chimps and individual hmm. gorillas that persisted over years and across different contexts. So I'm I'm going to I'm going to read more of this in a minute but what that means is Fred the chimp goes over to talk to Oscar the gorilla They do that to play Then tomorrow mm. or next year Oscar goes over and shares a meal with Fred Is that what I said his name was? I don't remember. <laughs> Fred's the chimp. Oscar's yeah, yeah, the yeah, gorilla. there we go. So anyway, the point is Different contexts, different activities, different timelines. Individuals recognized each other and interacted. Ambassadors of their species towards one another. That's oh, yeah. I mean, it, and it's happening. It's not just a one and a one. It's not just Fred and Oscar. It's like Brittany also came over to talk to Angela. Like it's it's everything, right? So it, it's it's a really, it's a, it's a common thing that's happening between these chimps and these gorillas. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the majority of remaining wild gorillas and chimps live together. They're the parts hmm. of the Congo basin that are a it's conservation nice. stronghold, the only place yeah. these animals can live. Yeah, they have to get along. 
Yeah, exactly. That's all that's left. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they so there's that's also where there's elephants, there's leopards, there's lots of endangered species. That that is the that's the that's the last bastion um, for the Congo Basin. So they're they're constantly being pushed into each other, and they're not having as much conflict. Instead, they seem You'd to think be interacting. It would be a lot of conflict. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and so there are Ooh. few, if any, studies of interactions between primate species that have been able to take the identity of individuals into account. Exactly what I was talking about, that, that the specific specificity of these two individuals are friends. <laughs> and so um, that really makes this specifically interesting. One individual traveling through a group of the other species to seek out a particular individual to interact with. So um, this is a review of published reports combined with a syn synthesis of previously unpublished data. So they had the they had their their published data and their un unpublished raw data from about 1999 to 2020, and they documented ape species engaging in a wide range of social interactions, ranging from play to aggression. So there were some arguments involved, but there was lots of positive interactions as well. They investigated possible benefits from their rendezvous. The most common one that they looked at was protection, because as I mentioned, there's leopards in this area as well. But based on all of the, the synthesis that they did, so the social interactions they saw could not be chalked up to the redu reduction of a threat. They found very little support for that idea because um, there wasn't a, a decrease in leopard snake or raptor predation attempts when they did this. So it, it was not... It was not helping them stay safe, but the number of chimpanzees in daily subgroups um, that that they saw that were kind of bleeding in to gorilla areas were very small, and gorillas within groups often have their silverback with them. So if they're already in small groups and they they do pretty well on their own, the chimps they don't need extra predation help, and if the gorillas have their silverback, that is their protector. So there's really no reason for them to be doing this for safety. Instead, they think that this is enhancing their foraging opportunities. So when they were co-feeding at the same tree, there were about 34% of the associations that they documented where that was happening, where they were just kind of eating next to each other. It's like parallel play with toddlers, if anyone's familiar with that. And then another 18% of observations involved apes foraging in close spatial proximity, but on different foods. So um, sometimes they, they weren't even eating the same plant next to each other. They were just eating near each other. <laughs> so it seemed to help um, with their foraging in one way or another. Maybe like, oh, there's a bunch of chimps over there. Maybe there's something good to eat. And these relationships persisted over years. So a couple mm -hmm. things with this. Um, one, of course, we can't assume that an ape's social landscape is entirely occupied by members of their own species. That is very right. clear. Right. Clearly. So this the is same part... way that, you know, we like bird watching. We're aware of all sorts of dogs and cats and all sorts of animals in our environment. Yeah. There's and I no mean, way. I have a dog in my family unit, but also I look for, recognize and enjoy the, uh, the, my time spent with other people's pets. Right. <laughs> They're my friends. <laughs> I know it sounds weird to say, but it's totally true, right? And if you talk to anyone who works with wild animals, you recognize your individuals that you work with and they recognize you. There is a recognition across species. So it's not a huge leap here. Um, but the other thing that this is so interesting um, that, that the researchers kind of drew a parallel from this to paleoanthropology, mm -hmm. there is a okay. huge assumption that early hominins would exclude each other from using the same resources from the same areas. But as we know, they were breeding together. <laughs> so it would follow that there was a lot more braided stream action between these different hominins than the kind of this strict exclusion of the Neanderthals are over here, the Denisovans are over here, the, you know, whatever. So this is a good a kind of potential personification of that as well. Um, if modern day observations with non-human apes can kind of inform what we think about early modern humans, that means that there could be interactions 
between um, different types of hominins in tolerant social contexts. And as much as like we look at ourselves, like the reason that we think that there's always going to be conflict between different species, it's like we look at we look at predator prey interactions and we think of ourselves, humans, we're always going to war. The reality is we are collaborating, we're cooperating, yes. we are being social mm-hmm. with most others for most of the time. Yeah, it's the, the mm-hmm. violence that actually is not as often um, yeah. the thing. And so if we look at it from that perspective, the benefits being a huge driver and not just the costs. Yeah, that's this is this yeah. is great. I love it. Yeah, but this is uh, we we got we gotta keep in mind that uh, this is also uh, a sort of forced closeness between yes, the yes forced so, into an area. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's one of the things that when we were talking about the archaic human interactions, uh, you know, one of the things that the one of the possibilities of why Neanderthals disappeared from areas that were occupied by humans is that they just left. They just said, ah, uh, there's there's other com- com- competitors for the resources. Places, we'll yeah. just go somewhere where there's, so, where there's not. So, yeah. Humans. So, Justin, you're right. They're in a smaller space, but there's also way less of them. So before we messed everything up and the Congo was much larger, yeah. there were also way more chimps and way more gorillas. So they still sure. would have been bumping into each other. And um, while well, And they would I, have recognized neighbors. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. It, would, it wouldn't yeah. be like, oh, stranger danger. It would have been, yeah. oh, we've right. met and a couple is, of times. There is a lot you. of We're that cool. in in, yeah. uh, in those dense jungle environments, too, where, you know, one bird call of, of a jaguar's present is alerting, you know, and maybe the, the monkeys in the jungle. Or, yes. you know, other species absolutely. are reacting off of that intercommunication jungle web uh, of information yes. that's out there. So... I, I, you know, I love this because this is also another another good strike against the uh, what was it the aggressive ape or the angry what were the yeah. that uh, that idea that all of humanity's ail, ails when it comes to warfare and it's violence from a basal ape basal yeah. ape brain that makes mm-hmm. it, it the, turns out and the angry just, chimpanzees are always evidence of that they're always yeah. mean yeah, well, no. well apparently not they hang out with gorillas yeah. um well before we close the animal corner i want to put a quick shout out into the ether for fat bear week is so, it that time like, again oh yes. my goodness voting started today you missed today's bracket already but oh, don't no. worry their it's voting time. continues through October 11th. So you can go to explore.org slash fat dash bear dash week and you can vote for the chonkiest bears. <laughs> um, so uh, real quick, besides this just being very, very fun. Awesome. Um, the, the, the point to this is that um, this is all taking place in the Brooks River in Katmai National Park, Alaska, and this is to raise awareness about bears and bear conservation. This is the time of year when brown bears are their fattest, and it's They've because that salmon. Yes, mm. they're about to go into hibernation, and so uh, we celebrate the bears that have been left alone and have had enough resources to be able to grow big and fat to survive the winter. And so, a fat bear is a is a healthy mm. bear for hibernation, and that means that they will succeed and make it through to the other side of their hibernation. So. Uh, so far this is where we're at <laughs> this is the bracket this is the bracket and you can see there was all there were already some winners so 164 1 over 335 164 was my choice and then 747 1 over 856 that was definitely the internet favorite 747 uh, a, a chonky chonky boy so <laughs> go check it out vote learn about brown bears Enjoy the silly Twitter that exists because of Fat Bear Week. NPR's yeah. tweeting crazy, silly stuff because of Fat Bear Everybody gets in on it. It's very fun. And it's an excellent time to um, learn about bears and, and celebrate bear conservation. So, and also, if you, if you need a few moments just to relax and need some sort of content on the internet that isn't going to stress you out. This is uh, it. They have, they have 24 yes. hour, uh, basically, yes. coverage. Uh, on explore right. or of, mm-hmm. of different parks you can actually watch the bears 
all year long, mm-hmm. basically sitting in that river eating. That's kind yeah. of what they do on those cameras all day long. Sometimes there's a little bit of drama. Oh, one bear gets into another bear's fishing hole and they kind of argue over it for a second. And there's a lot of like swiping and missing it fish and, you know, yawning and wandering around with new bear cubs at the beginning of the season. It's it's actually very therapeutic and fun. Also, my favorite is if I'm having trouble sleeping, I go to the rhino cam and dial yes. it back to when the rhinos are going to bed and they all come in. There's like six of them, I think, six or seven. Of them, and they all go in at the same time and hunker down and sleep. Uh, next These are to each little other. puppies, rhino they snuggle puppies. Up. They snuggle. Mm. They're a bunch of snuggly rhinos when they go to sleep. Uh, if you've got that feed, you can probably back it up uh, to, to scan back to the inside. Oh, I think you have to be on the inside uh, cam, though. Look, anyway, See when but it's they, Fat when... Bear Week. And it's Fat Bear Week, but there's uh, tons of content on this site, aside from That's, the Fat it's Bears. It's a great site. You can watch savannas that are being uh, filmed. They've got tons of live streaming cameras from wildlife parks Everywhere. around the world. Uh, always available. Good content. This is the content we came to the internet for. That's anyway. Yeah, they have orca camps too. They have orca camps. I don't want an orca cam. I just don't oh, know. I don't want to be privy to whatever orcas are getting up to. Playing mostly. <sighs> hey, Justin. Mm. Do you have science? I have some a uh, little bit here. Uh, this is a story. They've documented uh, hundreds of of favored nectar plants for painted ladies. That's a major North American butterfly species. This is mostly in the California area. They're worried about them. Southern California has been experiencing. About those, I thought you were talking about those San Francisco houses. Oh. <laughs> the painted ladies. Butterfly. So yeah. this is okay. this this is the uh, uh, the butterfly painted lady. Thank you. Uh, very iconic. Looks. I I couldn't tell this from a monarch butterfly. Honestly, they look the same. Uh, it is a migrating butterfly. They start down in Mexico. They work their way up through California. The study identified 195 new nectar plants for the species, uh, which it has published in the journal Environmental Entomology. Uh, this is according to Julian Saldivar, UC Riverside ecologist who led the effort. The lack of rainfall in Southern California likely impacts the butterfly's ability to move through the state, potentially decreasing nectar sources and causing them to die without reproducing. There's so much to be learned about these butterflies before drought and climate change damage them irreparably. So what they've basically done is they come up with a pretty good list. Ten of the most frequently observed plant species that are being fed on, uh, seven of those are native to California. And they've got a list, including the yellow feather, uh, yellow flowered rubber rabbit brush, blue wild hyacinth, common fiddle neck, Fremont's pincushion, black sage, heliotrope, and desert lavender. Bunch of plants that you can put in your garden. They're they're urging people to plant these as opposed to a non-native species. Although butterfly bush apparently is also a pretty good one, even though it's not native. <laughs> Justin, that doesn't backyard. look like a monarch. I feel I I have I feel to. Like that. It looks like a monarch. Like I can't tell the difference. It's the for the brown for and our orange. podcast listeners. I just have to stop and say, <laughs> look up, look up this butterfly. Uh, is, it is, is very that... pretty, but it does not look like a monarch. It's the same color as a monarch. monarch. Maybe it... it has the orange okay, and the and the dark yeah. brown black with yeah, it's white. Yeah, the same colors. It, Fine, but it's different patterns. Very different. Yeah, it doesn't like have yeah. the black border around the wing or anything like that. But so so you're very specific. <laughs> Apparently, I've probably been seeing monarch butterflies my whole life, uh, 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 painted ladies my whole life, and thinking they were monarchs because to me they kind of look the same. Perhaps. I'm not a great uh, butterfly observer. I don't spend a lot of time. But uh, good to know that there is a list now uh, that has been published. You can find a link to the study, at least on our website, about what you should be planting in California to preserve this native butterfly species. And I guess, I, and then my final story, my final story of the of the week was uh, talking about. Uh, Sante Pavo, which we covered in the first half. So 
I'm out of I'm out of stories. Oh, all right. Well, that will Nothing let me else. dive right into my stories. But before I do, I just want to remind everyone this is this week in science. And if you have not yet signed up to become a patron, you are how we keep our show going. We keep our show going through our patron sponsors. You produce this show by giving us the funds we need to make it happen. You keep us going and keep us podcasting. Keep us live streaming with all of your support. Head over to twist.org, click on the Patreon link, and uh, choose your level of support, $10 and more per month. And we will thank you by name at the end of the show. All right, everybody. It is... This week in science, I've got a couple stories before we close out the show. First up, first up, let's talk brain technology. Blair, as you move into the future, do you want to meld with the AI? Are you looking for a brain computer interface that will help you mind meld? No. And be one with the AI. <laughs> no, you're not. Okay. I'm sorry. I don't. I just want my brain to go in a jar or something so that it can live forever. But I just want to be me. <laughs> but hey, you know what? I will compromise. If this is how I get to live forever, I will take it. Okay. Well, researchers <laughs> are working on better electrodes. So the key to a good brain computer interface is a great connection to the brain. I mean, you also need the interface part, which converts all those electrical signals collected by the electrodes into something that a uh, machine learning algorithm can kind of figure out that can turn it into behavior and, you know, all the computerized stuff. But the first step is having a good connection to the brain, to the neurons. And so we are currently limited in the silicon, uh, the silicon electrodes that are created now. They can pretty much only be a set length and they can only really be like a set dimension. So they can only get because of the printing technology and the way that they've been created currently out of like the, the historical, the U Utah array, they are limited in the number and the size of the array that can be created. Carnegie Mellon researchers have now created what they're calling the CMU array, which is a nano printed electrode array that is an ultra high density array of micro electrodes. So it's 3D printed at nano scale that allows it to be uh, customized. And the idea that they that they did in their uh, in in their study putting it all together was pretty much trying to print electrodes all sorts of lengths, shove them together in smaller spaces, put them in larger spaces, spell letters and numbers with them. They just were like, let's do proof of concept. What can we do? And can we make electrodes go, you know, basically do whatever we want them to do, print them however we want them to be printed. And they did. They determined that, yes, indeed, they could create electrode arrays that were customizable using 3D printing technology, which is really cool, that allows these arrays to be just about whatever length, which is important because if you want to get the signals from the brain, maybe you want deeper neurons. Maybe you want neurons that are closer to the surface. Maybe you want to uh, change the geometry of the array to be able to collect a different electrical sample because really wherever the electrode is it's going to be collecting a number of signals from the nearby neurons and so the way that that array is created is going to have a big impact on its function they're able to create these little teeny teeny tiny electrode arrays to make them even smaller than they've ever been before and they think that this is going to usher in an entire new era of brain computer interfaces. But don't worry, they're probably not gonna get to human testing for about another five years. And then after that, it's still a number of years before it gets into real things. So we're looking at the outside, maybe, you know, 10 years or so before you really see the benefits of this. But yeah. it's the and of course my, that my first, first. My first reaction is like, do I really need a brain 
computer interface. No, I, no, no. using a touch screen is just fine. But of course, uh, there are there are applications for folks who would very much benefit from having uh, a, a chip in their brain, if, as a, if you will. Um, there's potential there if that interface can become seamless enough. Yeah. To work around blindness that can be a, a, a physical barrier of eyes. Yeah. Right? Or deafness, which is a physical barrier of the instrument through which you're hearing. Because everything gets converted to, into and becomes electrical signal at some point anyway. That's what we're based on. With the electron at a time of the ADP all the way up. It's an electrical system. Yep. Yeah. And maybe we, to control the mecha suit that you're wearing. I mean, you know, who knows? <sighs> there are not many reasons. I don't many know. Many reasons. What? The, you don't, you don't want a mecha the, suit? I don't want a mecha suit. I'm no, really not. That is the least of all the like th visions of the future. Yeah, we're going to put you into a mecha suit so you can clunk, clunk around. No, yeah, thanks. Man, have you ever thrown your back out? <laughs> Oh, you know what? Yeah. Now that you mention it, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I need a mecha suit. Oh, yeah. that would be fantastic. Yeah. Or maybe you know that you're the boy in the bubble and you just have, you know, you have your your self-contained atmosphere, your self-contained environment, but it's a mecha suit so that you can go out places and don't have to be the bubble inside the house. Maybe oh, you can get out homes. and go places. Yeah. Mecha suit. Uh, smelling. My, my mom lost the ability to smell due to cancer surgery, says in the chat room. Oh, I never, I, you know, I, for all of the senses, that I always discount smell it. <laughs> you mean like, oh, somebody's lost Very their important. sense of smell. It's like, oh, yeah. It's not like going blind or deaf or something like this where there's a bunch of other obstacles now in your way. You lose your sense of smell. It's minimal impact. But yeah. Taste That's is absolutely. impacted by losing your sense of smell too. It is it's a bummer. It is, but but uh, yeah, that's a, well, that's one I uh, didn't even think about. Of course, you could do that as well. Yeah, but anyway, there we we are humans with creativity, and so really any need, whether it's therapeutic or adding to our abilities, you know, these brain computer interfaces are going to be a big. They're going to play a big role in that. And so better technologies um, and technologies that can be specifically suited to specific uses will also be very uh, useful. It's going to be it's going to be really interesting. So anyway, new devices, they work. It's very exciting. We'll see where we get, where we are. We'll do an update in the next five or 10 years and let you yeah, know. Yeah, when we've got with uh, the AI with the with the whale communication linked yeah. into the brain chip and the whale riders. Of the no Pacific Ocean. Riders. I love it. I love uh, it. Right? Yeah. Jeez, if we're gonna do Avatar in any way, I mean that would I, that would be cool. Hey, we could have interspecies uh, uh, friendships. We know that it doesn't have to be you know a, a bad situation. Oh, yeah, it's just like uh, if things go bad on land. Have the whale riding society. Of, <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, <laughs> Okay, moving on from a whale riding society, we're talking about all our senses and Justin, you're bringing up, you know, like sight and touch and sound and all these things yeah. that could be affected uh, by using brain computer in interfaces. But, you know, what use is it if you're not really conscious, right? Consciousness is that thing that we think of as also being very human defining. Con our consciousness is our awareness of our time, place, space, where we are, who we are, we can describe it in detail. What is it? Researchers have come up with quantum explanations. They're coming up with, you know, chemical, neurochemical explanations. But there's a new hypothesis that has just been uh, published in uh, that, that was just published in, I believe it's Science Advances. And this, oh no, Cognitive and Behavioral Neurology, apologies. And the idea that's been put forward by a couple of researchers at Boston University, Andrew Budson, Kenneth Richman, and Elizabeth Kensinger, is that consciousness is a memory system. And that we don't 
actually have real-time consciousness, our consciousness is about a quarter of a second behind. And we know, we've heard before, that our awareness of stuff is behind what's going on in our unconscious brain. And so these researchers have developed this new idea using evidence such as the, the timing of, uh, of different neural signals in our unconscious and conscious brains and have developed this theory that basically consciousness is a memory system. And so we're con our, we are conscious, but it's a fast memory system. So it's, we're, our consciousness is our memory of a quarter second ago. <laughs> so we're not really conscious. We just have a good memory system. It's like, I don't know, uh, a rapid access memory, maybe. Hmm. Um, well, I mean, there's people that memory access, running memory, short-term memory loss, this sort of thing. Uh -huh. Still conscious. Still conscious. So, so, but the idea that, I mean, if, if, we, if we eliminated all memory, then what would you make of a conscious? You'd just be a reactionary organism. Right. Right. So only it be plays a role. And if you're only reactionary, then you can't be conscious. I feel like consciousness is, runs by the same rules as an improv stage act. <laughs> you get a suggestion from the audience and you've got to run with it. Yeah, the, the sketch that you're, uh, the things that are unfolding on the stage may change. They may evolve with time. But you got to still run with the theme that you were given. You can't just, so that's sort of what consciousness is. It's just running with the whatever memory suggestion you've been, you've been given to begin with. Right. And while, so that's actually. While the, you're on stage. And when and you leave and stage. And you're not far. Yeah, you're not far off of that either. Up. And because, yeah, what they're saying though is, so they say that uh, unconsciously, the decisions and actions are already made behind the scenes. Like your brain is already figured everything out for you. And then we are fooling ourselves into believing that we consciously made this decision because we're not aware of the decision that we made until after that decision has already been made and then we are acting on it. We are, we are actually like behind the present time. Like it's very, very, it's a very fudgy system. Yes, anyway, the, the researchers say that this explains like, you know, oh, well, a lot of, behavioral issues that we may have, self-control issues that we may have. We were, oh, I'm just gonna have one spoonful of ice cream. And then, oh my gosh, we ate the entire container hmm. because our conscious mind was not in charge. But our, our, if our unconscious mind is in charge, then that takes care of it. I mean, part of this, these mm. kinds of uh, That sounds like blame shifting. Yeah, that's, I kind of feel like that a little bit. Yeah, I agree <laughs> with you there. <laughs> um, but this does, they, they say in their paper, they're trying to provide a roadmap using this idea, considering neurologic, psychiatric, developmental disorders to be disorders of consciousness, including Alzheimer's disease and other dementias, delirium, migraine, schizophrenia, dissociative, dissociative identity disorder, certain types of autism, and more, and that this paper can provide a roadmap for clinicians, educators, and individuals to improve their behavior and gain knowledge by using methods that are shaped in memory system as a for the conscious and unconscious mind, as opposed yeah. to, you know, oh, it's quantum whatever entanglement that made me do it. Yeah, if you eat that entire thing of ice cream in the split second between memory and conscious awareness, then yeah, it was <laughs> the subconscious's <laughs> fault. But if, if within that split second, you only had the one spoonful, you can totally stop. Yeah. So the the animal question I have then <laughs> is there's a there's kind of a constant debate about whether certain species have consciousness and are self aware and all these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But it, by this measure, if they have memory systems, then they are conscious. Right. But memory but systems, sentience but not just, maybe not just, a, not the just, delay. Yeah, not just, yeah, it could, that could be the delay there. Yeah. So what they suggest is that it is the, uh, the cerebral cortex that is 
you know, the conscious, that's in charge of the conscious mind. And so our cer- animals that have more, more of a cerebral cortex then would have that possibility of being more sentient, having that uh, access to that kind of uh, memory. A little bit of quality but, control. Yeah. On yeah. the, uh, but we also don't know that all all animal brains are not the same. <laughs> Exa- oh, absolutely, different. They're different for, uh, formulations. I mean, yeah. different architectures. We mm-hmm. could say right. Um, but there are analogous structures that we okay. are that we're learning about. So, yeah, I don't know. I think it's really a, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, and you know, the thing that you that you always wonder so. Alcohol it caused blackouts. You're still functioning. You don't experience it. You're not conscious of it. You don't remember it. You are not at the wheel anymore. <laughs> you're not at the wheel anymore. You're still, but you're still functioning. Like Justin said, that reactionary system. Your brain is still going based on all the information it has in it and the inputs that are coming in. But that memory system to allow you to be conscious is not turned on anymore. So I think, I think that's so s- s- instances like that uh, where we, if we can delve into how that switch occurs and what happens, I think those are the kinds of, um, kind of, kinds of instances where we can learn mm. a lot more about our consciousness. Going to sleep, right? Mm. Conscious, unconscious. Anyway. Hmm. I'm very conscious while I sleep. I'm still all the time. Yeah, I, the lucid dreaming thing is is kind of crazy because the, the, then it brings up whether or not you've actually like go like. But I, I like the idea of that delay, that so split second delay, being the quality of control. I like being like this is this is uh, not just allowing consciousness to be the animal brain mm-hmm. by giving us a, a, a little bit of time. To reflect on the decisions that we're making that maybe the animal kingdom does not. Yeah, animal brain. <laughs> how do you know, though? You can't know that. No, you, well, you could, uh, I suppose. I do, hang on, no, I'm saying you could suppose, I suppose, do a, a similar type of experiments that were done on humans to find this, this subconscious reaction before the action. Uh, mm-hmm. and I'm sure they've been done. I don't know what the yeah. results are. So now I want to know, I want to know that. Yeah. It's Great just, I research. mean, there are lots of mm-hmm. studies where animals have sense of self. They have like an understanding of consequence and they, they make logical decisions and they do all sorts of things that could stack up to this existing in the animal kingdom. Right, but what? Yeah, we have to compare these things. We need to, we need definitely to, it's, not it's making the argument that they're not conscious. Yeah. I'm talking about the little separation that we call sentience, that sort of reflective aspect of decision making, that I would say takes place in, in humans much more so to a much greater degree than. Anywhere else in the animal kingdom. Well, I think you need to listen to This Week in Science because there are do. many, 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 there many are. studies about sentience there in the are. animal kingdom. Truth. So anyway. So But is anyway, it a lack of memory storage? It. That a lot, yeah, yeah. You, know what, you know what's going to give us more memory storage? Sleep? Finishing this oh. show and going to sleep. <laughs> Justin, yeah. I know you're, it's your morning and you're very conscious right now. Four cups of coffee. Yeah, like, I knew can it. tell. <laughs> knew it. <laughs> Super necessary. Ah. All right, everyone. I think we've made it to the end of the show. I hope you're still conscious. And I, I'm pretty sure I am. But you'd have to test it to really know. <gasps> Thank you so much for joining us. We're so glad that you've been here, whether for a short time, the whole time. We love that you've joined us. Thank you to a few people I want to shout out to. Thank you to Fada. Thank you for help with the show notes and on social media, all that work. Really appreciate the work that you do. Identity4, thank you for recording the show every week. So helpful. Uh, Rachel, thank you for editing the show every week. I love that. And... I would like to thank Gord and Goldazader and who else? Arnlore, others who help keep the chat room healthy and happy and 
nice in there. And our Patreon sponsors. I definitely must thank our Patreon sponsors for their help in bringing you this show this evening. Thank you to Teresa Smith, James Schaefer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazar, Ralphie Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Zazie, Woody, M.S., Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vagard, Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Jonathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Gaurav Sharma, Regan, Derek Schmidt, Don Munda, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshack, pronounced Myshack, Stu Pollock, St- Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Rudin, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Matt Base, Vote, Beto for Texas, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remide, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Rick Ramos, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Nappy, O. Adam Mishkan, Kevin Perrin-Tran, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bug Calder, Marjorie, Paul D. Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. Thank you all for all of your support on Patreon. It's only with your help that we are able to do what we do. If you would like to support us on Patreon, head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link on next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific Time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels, as well as twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast, perhaps while you watch one of the bear cams live? Just search for This Week in Science, or podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories, are available on our website, www.twist.org, where if you like, you can even sign up for a newsletter or click a link to find some groovy merch. You can also That's contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistmeanin at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, in the subject line. Your email will be spam filtered into, I guess, next year's Nobel Prize fondue. The after party. <laughs> and for the time being, you can still find us on the Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember. It's all in your head. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand Cause this week science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, science, science science. This week in science This week in science This week in science, 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 science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the... Don't understand It's the after show It's the after show Everyone, we made it to the end of the show, to the after show. Yeah, Aaron Lore, self-driving cars so that you can go places after you have had wine. That's nice. But that's also why currently it's great we have like taxis, Ubers, Lyfts. 
we need more we need more delivery but yes but if you if you have to go drive somewhere yes thank you all for joining us i hope you enjoyed the show anyway it has become the after yes paul here i'm putting in the link to the consciousness paper because I just find it very interesting. It certainly is. Yeah. Very fascinating and all the different concepts that they bring up in the... They, they put a little thought into their idea. It's not the end-all be-all, but they, they've thought about it a little bit. Dun, dun, dun! Put it in the Discord if you guys want it in there also. Sounds like people are awake in the upstairs world. Is that bad? Well, if it is my child, it's bad because it's 10 o'clock and he has school tomorrow. <laughs> that is bad. That is bad. <laughs> I mean, he's getting older, and every year it's a little bit older. He's still not old enough to be up until 10 o'clock on a school night, but he and he pushes, and he pushes, and he pushes, and he says, what is it really like? He just mm -hmm. manipulates. Just mm -hmm. Children, they are the masters of manipulation when it comes to bedtime. <laughs> Children, you say, it is time for bed, and they go, Oh, but I must pet the cat. And look at how cute the cat is. And look at how cute I am while I'm petting the cat. Oh, my okay, God. That's great. Go to bed. But I have to look at my fish now. And look at my wonderful fish. And I have three Stop frogs. Stop buying right? him pets. Is the I answer. only see two frogs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. you got so too many funny. pets he has to say goodnight to. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's part of it. Yes. Problem solved. See, you're welcome. No more pets. No more pets, Kai. It's what it comes down to. Yeah, that's it. Do you have tricks for getting children to bed, Justin? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not yeah. working. It's <laughs> well, yours is pre-verbal, so that's that's... No. That's part of the problem right there. Mine, He's mine, talking uh, now. Little one has, with you. Has a has a, a a blanket and a bank. Yeah. And you walk around, you walk around, and you sing songs for about forty five minutes to an hour, and then he'll sleep for like half an hour, and then wake up screaming because the bank fell out or the blanket's too far away, and then you go and you fix that, and then. We were up between uh, three and four in the morning uh, a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. I was like, I, he was like, well, I woke up and was just like, doo, 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 let's start today. I'm like, no, I got him out of, got him up and went over to the window and looked out and said, see, it's all dark. Oh, it's dark. nighttime. Yeah. All the birds are sleeping. He, he's a bird watcher. He loves and Take him to the zoo. Take him to the zoo. There's lions. There's, there's polar bears. There's also the elephants. You know what he's looking at? All the birds that are at the zoo. It's the most interesting thing to him. It's oh, watching yeah. birds. birds. He doesn't so care cool. about anything else. Well, yeah, birds are, they go, they jump between the trees. They flap their wings and they're flying. And that, like, birds are so fascinating. And then the animal whose name I always mess up because I, I can never remember what it is. It's, they have either... It's either meek rat or meerkat. And I don't it's know. meerkat. There's no such thing as a meek rat. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. He likes those too. He talks to those oh. at the zoo. He'll, 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 he'll babble at them for endlessly. As we're one day past zookeeper day. So you had to, you had to get in a, a zookeeper. <laughs> What? Put your hands, put your hands. I can't hear you. You're so Elephants far away from your head. Yeah, we can't hear yeah. you. Oh, yeah. Elephants are big, so he puts his hands up in the air and shows how big he is, too. Look, I'm big, too. Like an elephant. Like an elephant. Yeah. Very nice zoo here, by the way, in uh, the oh, lovely city of I Copenhagen. see the zoo. I bet. 
It is phenomenal. Uh, we will uh, put together Zoo. Good night, Fada. And yes, thank you for Greylark for the raid, and thanks for helping engineer that, Fada. That's awesome. Does can somebody explain to the old person what y'all talking about? So on Twitch, when somebody has a channel and is streaming and either you know doing whatever they do on their channel, creating their content, whether it's talking about science like us or uh, DJing, playing music, or playing video games. You know, they're doing their Twitch stuff. They finish their stream, but they send their viewers to another channel so that their their viewers aren't just left with nothing. And so the raid is when that channel ends and all those people come into your program unannounced and oh. they come into the chat room and usually they come into the chat room and they're like, hey, what's going on here? Blah, blah, blah. Nice. Because it's very community chat oriented and it's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. So what's a Twitch? So Twitch, you know Twitch. A Twitch, what's a Twitch? <laughs> it's like a, a muscle spasm. <laughs> so this is fun fact. I don't know anything about okay. What's going on in the so, uh, social media stuff? So. Oh, I know. And I know it's that Twitch lot. was the thing that was around a while ago, and I, I didn't know it was still there. It's good to. Yeah, so it was Justin TV, and then it became Twitch. Oh, is that TV. what that was? I remember that because it had my name in it. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it was all the live streamers doing all their yeah. stuff, and and then Justin TV kind of ended, but turned it, it was bought by twitch tv and so that became a thing that turned into twitch tv and then it was really for gaming and then like that's what a lot of people were doing there but then they decided let's do lots of other things and they started getting other live streamers and creative pursuits there and um during the pandemic it became massive for djs and so yeah mm. so music has been a big one yeah mm. i love watching yeah i watch a lot of djs over on twitch Arlen or fun or fact, it. Justin could have just stopped at, I don't know anything, and just left it. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. I know, a, I know some things. It. I know some things. <laughs> you do. You know a lot of things, actually. That's right. And Gord stuff. streams on Twitch. So our longtime listener viewer, Gord, is on Twitch gaming a lot, doing a lot of things, Thursday to Monday, 11 p.m. to 4 a.m. Gorge, you're up all night. You are a night owl. How fascinating. Yeah, so Mark Meppyman, um, as you're saying there, Twitch does a lot of gamification to get money out of people. Um, and that's, you know, because we're, we're streaming all at the same time to different channels and we're... Um, you know, we're a podcast and that's what we are broadcasting like our, our talk yeah. show. So the idea of stopping and doing a lot of the uh, prompting and the gamification kind of things that have been baked into the Twitch model, I just don't see that working really well for us. Hey, um, but, uh, yeah, you, but if, if you're if, missing if people, out. If people, if I know I am, but if people want to subscribe to us on Twitch, you can. And then you can you can buy people subs and you can you can get buy bits. I guess I guess that's a thing that they say. Hey, get some biddies. That that's what the D. I don't know. There's a DJ. Hey, I'll just, hey if you're afraid of missing bitties. out, you've been missing out on this show, and we mm -hmm. have uh, uh, also uh, things that should concern you, and then products you can buy that would alleviate those concerns to some degree. That you should just buy those from yeah. us, and we yeah. have. Uh, we don't have any of that, in fact. No, but no. if people start, what is it? They could make a hype train right hype now. Train. A hype train for us. I'm, is that a new that. streaming it's, thing? It's a Twitch. But yes, bits and subs and things. You could do that over on Twitch. And if you do that, I will bring Cappy up here. And she'll, is, she'll look at you and she'll hate about, me for picking her up. What are you talk about? Bits and subs. Come here. Come here, Cappy. What are we talking about? Did we get any bits and subs? I don't know. But you've got a kitty cat. Oh, yeah. And if you're not a long-time listener and you're really into crypto, Ooh. 
This is not a show that talks about that at all. Sorry. We don't. We don't talk about crypto at no. all. Blair is saying another way that you could support us is going to our Zazzle store. You making pillows? Oh, we yeah. do have cool stuff. Cool. Merch. We don't have gaming. We just have. We have sizing. a lot of. We have a lot of merch that is not uh, specifically show branded, and we have some that is. Yes, it's true. The back of that, like true. you can put it on your white decorative chair. Sure. <laughs> oh, okay. This just actually, just I think I have a that chair. That's why that's are quote unquote accent chairs. So expensive, dude. I'm, I'm like, I, I, I'm like, look, I, I'm like, I need a chair. I need a couple chairs. And I'm looking around at chairs. And chairs are really expensive. Oh my gosh! I'm like, how do people like just buy chairs? And they're like, look, I got chairs. It's like, you don't just go buy chairs. You have to think about buying chairs. This is it. If you only need one. So, uh, there's actually a really cool thing that uh, I saw a whole bunch of chairs that I really liked and was told I couldn't have any of them. Uh, and they were very cheap. There's, uh, so there's a recycling center, a uh, short drive from, uh, from anywhere in Copenhagen. And the recycling center is cool because they got, you know, the, the bins are set out there. So you can throw the wood over here, your metal over there. If it's ceramics, there's a place. If there's... Uh, whatever it is, you got cardboard, mm -hmm. plastic, yeah. you can throw it all on the things. Adjacent to that, combined with that recycling center is an upcycling center. So people bring all kinds of furniture that they're like, ah, I'm done with this. I'm going to just recycle it. And they can kind of uh, show it to the folks that work there and be like, I have these chairs. Should I throw them in the wood bin or do you want to put them in the, the upcycle store? And so they, there's all this actually pretty fantastic furniture. Yeah, it's a little That's threadbare great. here and there. And, you know, it's got the, the typical secondhand store uh, charm to it. But it's, it's built into their recycling center that useful household items and stuff that doesn't necessarily, that might have a second life gets to go in and then people can shop and, uh, as well. So there's also the danger of getting rid of the old furniture <laughs> and coming home, home with, with other you. old furniture. Yeah. Yes. But I was, oh, I was, specific. I found so many cool chairs with all, being Europe, all sorts of accents. Like all of the accents were present in these chairs. Yeah. And they, uh, but I wasn't allowed to, to take any of them. Oh, oh, I like Paul so Disney's real. question. Why are accent chairs? I think that is the more fundamental question. I think you're right. Paul. And yes, Eric Knapp, you pay extra for the accent. It's true. Oh, yeah, Eric Knapp, uh, Habitat for Humanity restores. Those are fantastic. Mm. And we've Especially got if you those. need a door. The, the, <laughs> the one, rebuilding the... center is fantastic for that also. We've got I... a place called the rebuilding center where it's just like windows and doors and trim things that have been I, ripped out of houses it's great. i've been to a restore uh it was pretty awesome uh mm -hmm. i mean really like tons of really funky cool furniture and stuff like that and all but the, the thing that impressed me was walls upon walls of this warehouse of just doors they had all of the doors if you need a door go to a humanity restore store to get your door because they have all the doors there that you could possibly like ever need. I like to open doors. I have an open door policy. Wee -hee -hee -hee. Yeah, I mean, really, the idea, it's hard. You wanna buy pretty nice things, but sometimes, you know, it's better to recycle, right? Reuse, recycle, find the things that have already been made as opposed, and give them a second life as opposed to buying something brand new. Sometimes. Sometimes the brand new things are great if you know that you're going to use them for a very long time. Mark Meppy Man, did you miss all the science talk? It's very possible, I think. But I think we recorded it. We did. I so think we recorded it a few places. Yes. We sh you're good. 
you're good. All right. It's all it's all reviewable. In fact, I think we may have. If you want to go back through the archive, there may be thousands of hours of sexy talk available at this point. <laughs> thousands of hours. It's true. Yeah, noodles. The prices are up on everything these days. Inflation's real, yo. Oh, Gnome Sane says, where's our Lego calendar fix of the week, Blair? Oh. Uh, I don't have anything new, but I can I can I can share with everyone. I'm gonna do a bunch this weekend, but um, okay. do I have any requests from the previous set? I don't have anything new. I'm just trying to make iPhone cases with my art right now. That's all. <laughs> but we need Legos, Blair. I hear Lego you. animals. <laughs> I didn't get them done. I worked a 12 hour day on Saturday. I'm not pushing you. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. I get to work another 12 hour day this Saturday. Uh, yeah. That's a lot. Yeah, it's event season. Uh, Ooh, look at this. Ooh, yeah. look at this. Gotta look at oh wait I gotta roll scroll down here there we go add to stream da 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 think about this nice a guinea pig iPhone <laughs> case meep, meep. what you doing Cappy maybe <laughs> make him a little bigger there we go yes little guinea that's pretty cool paul has been doing the trouble all week too like, that's no gotta, fun there we go. That'll do it, I think. Lego is like sheep. That's mm -hmm. Robot cats on bicycles. Is this the science Lego that you're requesting, Lauren? <sighs> <laughs> hey, you gotta uh, you gotta make sure it fits. I know, but okay. So you're it, depending on the photos that you're doing, and mm -hmm. I know how you had said you were gonna maybe put them in some. You know, realistic mm -hmm. environments or maybe do some um what are those boxes that you put them in shadow boxes in, yes shadow boxes put the animals in boxes blair um yes no saying is saying blair tell us how the lego animals will interact for photos maybe we can do some extra special photos of different animals oh yes inter <laughs> interacting because you'll have physical structures that you can like, yeah they can play with each other. Fight. Can, <laughs> right? <laughs> I think it could be great. Yeah, no, that's perfect. Um, the, this uh, iPhone case looks great. I'm gonna I'm gonna add it to our, our thing. Put it up there. Oh, the uh, the dart mission, right. the asteroid that NASA hit left a, a trail of debris ten thousand kilometers long. I know earlier Which, this week it was 6,000 kilometers long and that number's just gotten bigger. <laughs> well, it's 6,000 miles. 6,000 oh, okay, miles. Okay, okay, okay. All right. 10,000 kilometers. And if you're not familiar with kilometers, miles, that's approximately it. a million meters? It's a lot. That's a big trail. A of, but did it yeah. move the moonlit? This is, I mean... I don't care about. And apparently, we've still got to wait some months. I know. To to know if it's moved it enough. I guess we didn't move it much. If we did, otherwise, it would be more noticeable. It's just a nudge, just a yeah, nudge in space. Nudge, a nudge in space. I like nudging. Uh, Blair, mm -hmm. Noodles would like to know if you if uh, once you get the phone case created, if. The phone case can be um, altered based on the phone that a person has. So can mm -hmm. you like be like, oh, I would like this phone case, but I want it as an Android or whatever. Yes. I think you can and do that, right? If, yes, but it, it doesn't, it's not very smart. So if you change it and the like, <sighs> the gutters are wrong or like it cuts off the face of the guinea pig with the camera hole or anything like that, just... Um, Email me or Twitter me, and I'll make one for whatever case you need. Yeah, great. Awesome. That would be great. 
If it doesn't work for you, ask Blair. I'll do it. I just want to know. Two months. I don't want to wait two months, but I just want to know. Did we nudge it? Did we move it? Because that is what we need to know so that we don't have uh, mile high, kilometer high, was it kilometer high waves hitting our shores. Oh, my and goodness. We don't want that. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. That is... And it's that not the wild. it's not the asteroids that we can see that I'm worried about. <laughs> it isn't. That's the ones I'm worried about. I think we would see the eight mile diameter one. It's the, it's the dark. Us. It's the dark ones. The ones that oh. are dark that are hiding in the dark, and we haven't seen them yet. Those are the ones. So so there's always like like I I guess well, I guess it was uh, the pretty much the plot of Don't Look Up. Or the, the situation <laughs> for don't look up, but there is there is some reality to spotting something of that size heading our direction, having no ready mission to intercept and to adjust course, and having depending on how far out they see it, six eight months a year maybe, as the thing gets ever closer, and humanity is faced with timeline. I don't want a timeline. I don't want to see those talk shows. I don't want to hear the conspiracy. Nope, nope, nope. nope. But, 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 nope. Now, based on your knowledge uh, that ga you gained today from uh, listening to Twist, you know that you got to get away from the coast. <laughs> get away. <laughs> Depending it's on It's most likely going to hit the water. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. So get yourself to a high elevation somewhere, you know, away from the coast, or maybe a mile up. I live on a hill now, but I don't think it's high enough. <laughs> oh, and you live in a highly tectonic area anyway. Yeah, You'll have earthquakes and tsunamis going on all over the place there. Uh, you know, somewhere we'll be safe. And so spread out, humans. Uh, go everywhere and, and, you know, but avoid the coast. That's what you need to do. Avoid the coast. The coast is so pretty. But it does also make you wonder about the quality of the archaeological record <laughs> of being affected by uh, by that event. I mean, there's there's a lot that we must have just lost uh, that can't be recovered from that event. A lot. Well... From that event, not much archaeological in terms of people, but paleontological. Paleontological, sure. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the now, origin of the origin in. of life stuff. What did they just find? They found, uh, <sighs> where was it? Was it in S Scotland? What did they find? That's someplace strange. The predecessor of pterosaurs, a little wingless lizard like creature. Fast Did they find it in Loch Ness? Little reptiles. <laughs> they find it in there. I don't know where they found it. <laughs> See, I don't know how, how uh, I've got the slow internet on, uh, setting on apparently. Slow loading. My computer slow must be doing something. I must be is the temp dreaming mode. something. I don't know. I know you're doing AI art right now, aren't you? No, Lauren Gifford, I have not tried AI art myself. I have a, appreciated the art that other people have been creating. It's very fun. Um, it's a whole thing. It's a whole thing. Hey, Blair, maybe that's what the calendar should be next year. What? AI you can, art? You can use AI art to create the animals. <gasps> All right, I'll take a year off. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds uh, like you're telling me to take a year off. No. <sighs> yeah, right? I mean, that is if you accept the AI art as final creations that don't need any further tinkering mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. from your human creativity. 
exactly. Right. That whole nonsense. That whole thing. That whole thing. <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, uh, the little lizard was found in Scotland apparently a hundred years ago, over a hundred years ago. Uh, and it was probably sitting there in a museum box somewhere. It's been it's been connected as an ancestor of pterosaurs. Cool. Oh, my but cat uh, my internet me is me in a full. You brought me a fish. Fail mode oh, so right cute. now. Is it? My heater is on full yeah. fan mode. I don't have a heater controller here. Do you hear it in the background? Nope. Oh, well, that's good. My cat is so cute. Ah, she so just brought me a toy fish. She said, meow, 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 and she dropped a fish. It's wonderful. All right, Blair, is it time? It it's is. time. I'm, I'm just finishing up a uh, Japanese mossy together. frog beach towel. So that's going to be in oh. the store in a minute. Oh, wait. I, actually, you know what? I don't know what a Japanese mossy frog is. I'm only familiar I, with the Vietnamese Japanese variety. mossy frog. But that is a, that is a very... The, if it's anything like the Vietnamese mossy frog, it's really cool. Uh, that's it what I meant. Come on, that's what I meant. Oh well, I don't, I don't know. I'm just checking. There could be more than one mossy I'm frog. I'm doing in the so world. many things at once right now. Moss, moss frog, moss frog. There it is. There it is. Yeah. That's calendar right here. That's 2022 a, cool calendar frog. with the mossy frog. This is gonna be a beach towel. Yeah, I'm almost done. Ooh, Give me one second. I'll share. Pretty. That's a background blender. I have ever seen one. Yeah. Here we go. I never heard Here we that. go. I love yeah, the frog mouth. My interwebs. This is don't the Tony like frog mouth is one of my favorites. Anymore. It's uh, it's Brian's favorite. That's why really he saw I was making that towel and he was like, "Buy that." <laughs> uh huh. My Tony frog mouth. This common snapping turtle. This year's calendar has so many wonderful animals. And the guinea pig can now be on your phone. He fit wonderful. well. Smilodon was September. But this year. Yeah, I'm for Species Requiem Day. Yep. Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna, uh, just uh, end my time. segment a little early. Yeah. Uh, and just by saying, uh, real quickly, uh, say good night, Blair. Yeah. I'm trying to share a picture of the towel. He has to let the me. The internet's in. broken. Oh, sorry. I didn't no, see that's it. Okay. With... There. Sorry. There it is. There's the towel. It's towel. there for you. All right. Good night. Good, say, say, say good morning, Justin. I don't remember. <laughs> good morning, Justin. <laughs> Good, Good night, night Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We love that you've been here. Make sure you hit those subscribe buttons and the likes and the loves and the up arrows and all that kind of stuff that's on the positive side of things. Get those algorithms liking us more. Good night. Good morning, wherever you are. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay curious. We will see you again next week. Good night.